Welcome to Window to China Cable TV. I'm the host, Xin Yu Zhang. I'm pleased to have Delegate David Bluba with me today on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, first of all, it's, it's great to, to be here. Um, I was actually uh, raised in Fairfax County, went to Robinson High School, and that's where I met my, my wife, Gretchen. Uh, we both went off to the College of, of William and Mary, and when we came back, uh, settled down in, in the Fairfax area, uh, raised uh, three great kids. Uh, we have an 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a, a seven-year-old, and got very active in uh, civic responsibilities. And so I was chair of the county's Consumer Protection Commission for a number of years, uh, served on the board of uh, Brain Injury Services, and so really loved being active in the community. And uh, 10 years ago, I was given an opportunity to run for the Virginia House of Delegates, and won that seat, and I've represented the area ever since. Uh, professionally, I, I am an uh, environmental planner. I work for an environmental and engineering consulting firm out in Chantilly on mm -hmm. water resources and Chesapeake Bay restoration issues. Mm -hmm. As a state uh, delegate, what do you work on? Yeah, well, the exciting thing about being a state delegate is that there's lots to work on um, mm -hmm. in any particular year. Uh, and we're a part-time legislature, so we're only down in the General Assembly for, for two months. But we have about 2,000 bills that, that we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, for me, you know, the issues that I work on are really the things that are most important to my constituents. So I sit on the House Education Committee and have worked very closely on education and mm -hmm. testing reform issues. Uh, transportation, I mm -hmm. uh, was very pleased that a couple years ago we could get more money for transportation. Mm -hmm. Now it's a matter of making sure that that money goes to the right kind of projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and also economic diversification and helping small businesses to succeed. Uh, they're, they're the backbone of our economy. Um, I, I've also really focused on environmental issues with my professional background, uh, but also on identity theft issues. Um, I was the, the victim of identity theft uh, about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and so I've made it one of my missions to help protect people from identity theft, and if they are the victim of identity theft, uh, to ensure they have the, the tools to uh, keep those uh, bad things from happening to them. Mm, I'm glad you're here. So uh, we are having Delegate David Blue with us on Channel 10. If you want to join us, have a conversation with us, or have a question, want to ask him, call 571-749-1142. Thank you. Uh, so as to the transportation, I know it's the project like I-66. So what's going on there? I heard about a lot of concern on that. Sure, yeah, and I, I, I-66 is, is a mess. Any, anybody who lives in, mm -hmm. in uh, Fairfax understands that we need to do something with I-66. And so there's a plan right now to widen I-66, uh, mm -hmm. to put in uh, toll lanes. Uh, and also implement something called bus rapid transit, uh, which is uh, making sure that people can get back and forth quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. The concerns are making sure that we minimize the impacts of mm -hmm. that development on the surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of concern uh, about not taking people's houses or, or backyards, and mm -hmm. so we've been working very closely with our Virginia Department of, of Transportation mm -hmm. uh, to reduce the impacts uh, mm -hmm. on that. For me, you know, the whole issue of transportation is that it needs to be multimodal. Um, you know, we can fix I-66, um, make it more efficient and effective, but we also need a lot more in this area to get transportation moving. And so we also need to focus on fixing bottlenecks, Mm -hmm. uh, such as the intersection of I-66 and Route 28, mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually a project that's in the works, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, getting the metro out to Centerville uh, mm -hmm. and Gainesville, and finally using technology to make our existing infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. used better. Um, and so timing our lights better, things like that, so that we can get better use out of our existing roads. Hmm. So have you come up to the, any uh, recommendations? Like which solution do you think best in your opinion? Sure. Well, yeah, we do need to, to widen I-66. You know, the, the mm -hmm. thing that I'm most concerned about is taking our uh, HOV lanes mm -hmm. um, and moving them from HOV 2 to HOV 3, because mm -hmm. that means people right now who are able to use I-66, mm -hmm. uh, they won't be able to use I-66 if it's moved from HOV, to HO, HOV 2 to HOV 3. And mm -hmm. so especially if those are going to be toll lanes, uh, we need to ensure that we're not taking something away uh, that is already available to, to folks. But you know, again, it, it's a it's something that we need to have an all of the or all of the above strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we can't pave our way out of 
our transportation crisis here in Northern Virginia, mm -hmm. and yet fixing transportation is essential to our economy. Yeah. Uh, businesses will stop coming here if, if we don't do something about it. Right, I agree about that because the traffic congestion really hurt the people's quality of life. Sure, you yeah. know, the people concerned, really concerned. But but I just think about if people change their life habit, mm -hmm. then to like help them go up to get more trails or path. Right. The, help them to get up to them by bicycling or walking, yeah. get rid of cars, actually, maybe actually, that's... You, you raise an excellent point. Uh, a lot of the problems that we face today are, are because of poor land use planning. And so you don't have connectivity, uh, you can't walk to work, uh, you can't walk to shopping. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have better land use planning that allows you to uh, avoid getting in your car in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's going to take a lot of work. Um, you know, we've got some success stories here in Northern Virginia that I think we can be proud of. Mm -hmm. And we also have to keep other localities that are now developing today from making the same mistakes that, that we need uh, or that we made in the past. Mm, great. I think if you know that uh, we are having delegates um, David Blua with us on Channel 10. If you want to join us, please call in. 571-749-1142. Oh, is it have caller in now? Hi, caller, what's your name? Hi, oh, my name is Thank you. Okay, so do you have any questions? All right, uh, I was wondering what the delegate has done to support minority and small businesses in Virginia. So what have you done for minority and the small business sure. in Virginia? Yeah, a great question. Um, and actually, there's a lot of exciting things going on with respect to small and minority owned businesses in, in Virginia. And small businesses are really, it's the backbone of our economy. And what I'm really excited about, um, you know, the immigrant and minority community in Northern Virginia is that they are such entrepreneurs. And so we need to make sure that we're supporting them in every way possible. Uh, there's a couple of different things going on. So, you know, first of all, we're always looking for ways to make it easier uh, to successfully start a small business and to remove barriers mm -hmm. uh, for small businesses. And mm -hmm. so a great example, I was approached by the, uh, a local yoga studio owner a couple years ago mm -hmm. who uh, was very concerned about a new regulation that the state had put out that they thought mm -hmm. uh, was going to cost them a lot of money and quite frankly thought that it would cause them to go out of business. Mm -hmm. And so myself, um, then Senator Mark Herring, who's now the Attorney General, went down, introduced a bill mm -hmm. uh, to fix the problem mm -hmm. and as a result, you know, that person's business and, you know, other yoga studios could continue to, to flourish. Mm -hmm. Another big challenge is how to raise capital uh, for small businesses because you know oftentimes you want to start a business you got a great idea but the, the but, money the, from? but the bank is yeah. you know, I'm not willing to take that risk and this year we passed legislation that allows you to raise capital using uh, crowdsource funding and so you, you go online you, you set up a program and, and people can essentially uh, in, invest in your idea mm -hmm. when you reach that critical mass you get the money and they become part owners of your idea. And so you see that a lot with respect to fundraising, uh, and now you can do that for, for a small business, which I think is really cool that you know, Virginia's on the front end of that. The, the last thing is procurement. Um, Virginia spends billions of dollars each year uh, to procure uh, different services. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that our small and minority businesses get a share of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so Governor McAuliffe, uh, working with the General Assembly, has uh, really focused on making sure that our procurement system is fair towards small businesses. And one of the things that we're doing is to unbundle our uh, procurement packages. And so right now, when a state agency wants something, they tend to bundle up all these goods and services into one contract which makes it very difficult for a small business to be able to compete for that because they're looking for a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is taking that and making it into small pieces so that a small business with a specialty actually has a chance at, at really getting that work. And so I think that's a really good step in the right direction. Oh, that's a very good answer. Yeah. So is that a good answer for you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for calling. Stay with us, watch Channel 10 Window to China program each Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Thank you for calling again. Bye-bye.
So we are back with uh, Delegate uh, uh, Blua. Uh, we are having you uh, on Channel 10. It's really happy. Uh, so you support minority group. I think they really need the support. Usually the language is problem. It's some regulation is really complicated for them. Sure, I mean, especially like you said, support the capital for their starting business. Mm -hmm. That is the critical. That's the key. Thank you, have you done that? I mean, this year is 2015. Every elected official will run again if they decide to run yeah. again. I mean, it's, how about your uh, re-election focus? Yeah, well, you know, for, for my re-election focus, and the, the election is November 3rd, and so mm -hmm. I want to make sure everybody puts that on their calendar. <laughs> uh, you know, for, for me, you know, it's about running a positive campaign. Uh, and so I want to be able to get out there and present the issues and have an honest debate about you know the direction that Fairfax do is Do you have is going. any opponent? Uh, I do have an opponent, oh. yeah. And so you know the, the, the nice thing about this area, my mm -hmm. district, is it's one of the few competitive districts that are left in, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that debate about transportation and investing in education and economic diversification. But there are a lot of parts of Virginia mm. uh, that don't have competitive districts like mm. this. Yeah, and let's that's, talk about the redistricting, yeah, it, the purpose for yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And and so I, that's not very healthy for our democracy. If if you have districts that are so heavily one party or the other, mm -hmm. people don't come out for elections because they think that the you know that it's that it's already decided, okay. um, and that's you know because our our laws allow poli the political party in power to gerrymander those districts, mm -hmm. and so I think it's very very important for Virginia to adopt nonpartisan redistricting reform so that we can have more competitive districts in mm -hmm. Virginia, um, so that you do have this honest debate. We're actually going down uh, into special session on August seventeenth because the courts uh, decided that our congressional mm -hmm. districts are unconstitutional, mm. uh, that they violate the Civil Rights Act. And so we'll be going down there trying to redraw those districts and make them fairer. We need to take that a step further. Wow, we're looking for that. Uh, come back it's August 17th and report for us. Thank right, right. you for your work. And artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact cfrip at aol.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. Welcome back, David Blua. Speaking of your clean energy legislation and the professional career, I have several questions to ask you. So what caused um, a renewable energy policy so controversial? Sure, and, and it shouldn't be controversial because um, there's a, a lot of benefits to uh, mm -hmm. renewable energy. 
Um, you know, you, you take a look at it from the economic development standpoint. Uh, there's a tremendous potential for uh, green energy and job creation. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at it from an environmental standpoint. You know, mm -hmm. the idea of cleaning up, cleaning up our air, cleaning up our water, our waters, um, helping to uh, stem. Uh, climate change, you know, which is Virginia is very susceptible to, mm -hmm. um, you know, and also national security. And mm -hmm. so when you think about all the fossil fuels and where they come from, you know, the great thing about green energy is that it's produced here. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, we have control over that and that we're not reliant on, on other, other countries. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is that it's, it's change. And so, you know, there are parts of, of Virginia and parts of the United States that uh, their economies rely on, on coal production and fossil fuel production. Mm -hmm. And so as we move to a green energy economy, uh, it's very important that we remember those folks who very well may lose their jobs as a result of, of that and provide them with the technical support and education so that they can ensure that their economy is strong and that they're not left behind. And so I think that's some of the trepidation. Mm -hmm. you know, and so you know, as a Northern Virginian, you know, I need to make sure that I'm aware of and cognizant and sensitive to the fact that we need to be supporting other parts of our state as we transition to green energy. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about the wind energy and the mm -hmm. solar energy. That's right. kind of different solutions. Yeah. Wind energy, like in China, they have big investment, kind of leads the world, but also is the fifth electricity source in resources uh, in U.S., which one you prefer, the solar energy or wind energy for U.S.? Sure, and, and I, I am a fan of, of both uh, solar and, and wind. Mm -hmm. um, right now, where Virginia's best wind potential is, is actually offshore. Mm -hmm. And so if you go out to the Appalachian Ridge, uh, Virginia, you'll see a couple of wind farms, uh, but it's the wind isn't great, and so there's limits to that. Mm -hmm. uh, we created a wind energy development authority in Virginia mm -hmm. that is looking at how do we get energy from offshore wind power, and so I'm very excited about that prospect. Mm -hmm. the, the great thing about solar is that you could put it anywhere, and so when you think about all the rooftops, all the parking lots, you know, mm -hmm. all the space in, in Virginia mm -hmm. that, that you know you could put solar panels, mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing. And so you know, I, I think that's just got a, a tremendous amount of a potential. The, the shortfall is is it when it's not sunny out, you, you need a way to store that electricity, mm -hmm. and so we need to ensure that we're investing in. Uh, battery technology to be able to store that, mm -hmm. you know, as, as well as backup power, you know, so that if you don't have a source of, of uh, wind or um, solar, you know, that you still have electricity that's affordable for folks. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the burden for, like, uh, the difficulty for starting the solar business? Sure. Solar energy business. Yeah. Well, so for instance, right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, part of it is that we uh, subsidize things like coal. So Virginia mm -hmm. um, has tax subsidies for coal, mm -hmm. and it makes them able to com uh, outcompete things like solar. And so, all we would like to see is at least a level playing field for solar uh, and wind versus other other sources of, of energy. And so we need to level that playing field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other part is, um, you know, ensuring that we're identifying public-private partnerships mm -hmm. and other barriers to entry. And so this year, uh, I introduced a, uh, a bill um, at the behest of the governor uh, mm -hmm. that creates a solar uh, energy development authority. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of the authority is, you know, again, to, you know, look at how do we create markets for solar energy mm -hmm. and how do we remove barriers uh, for small businesses that want to get into solar. And I'll give you a great example. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my senator, Senator Chap Peterson, actually mm -hmm. sponsored this bill and I helped him out over the House side, mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of homeowners associations that won't allow you to put solar panels up on your roof. Mm -hmm. uh, just absolutely no, you can't do it. Which is a real barrier to small companies that want to be able to do that and homeowners who want to make that investment. And so we passed a law that said, uh, a homeowners association can regulate how you do it, but they can't right. forbid it. They can't yeah. prohibit you from being able to do that. And so it's small steps like that uh, mm. that are, are going to put us in the right direction. Right. The policy should be changed not from them, from the legislators, right? Right. right. Yeah, I heard about that. Uh, even uh, Hillary Clinton set up the big goals that it's going to increase 700%. Uh, solar installation in mm -hmm. every family in 
on her on her first term. Right. So that's very. Um, do you think it's the big goal? Yeah. So how about the goal in Virginia? What are the goals set up in Virginia? What are the goals? In yeah, Virginia? about well, the solar energy. Yeah, and we need, we need to revisit our goals. Our our renewable energy goals um, mm -hmm. have been voluntary, mm -hmm. so we've been moving slowly in the in the right direction. But we we need to up the ante. Um, and, and actually, a lot of the business community is mm -hmm. starting to push even even without our goals. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, uh, Amazon um, has a data center uh, in uh, rural Virginia down there. Um, I think it's the Middle Peninsula or, or Northern Neck. And rather than hooking into you know regular electricity power, uh, they have created a, a solar farm down there to generate their electricity. And so that was something that they did because it made sense economically. And so we're very proud of that. But you know, business is ultimately going to lead the way on this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, government needs to figure out how to facilitate that and and make it easier for businesses to want to do that. Mm. So for the environmental uh, issues, I mean, you can probably give us advice. When we install it or set up this kind of uh, green energy devices, mm -hmm. what is the help? What is the significance for the environment? I like like a climate a climate change. Right. Yeah, and and certainly moving from fossil fuels to green energy is is a huge part of that. Um, you know, Virginia is a small part of a much larger global effort that has to happen with respect to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if we don't, you know, why else would anybody else do it? And so we, we need to make that investment and lead by example. Virginia has the most to lose by not acting. Um, we have the Port of Hampton Roads. Uh, which you know is billions and billions of dollars worth of infrastructure that we've invested in, and yet it's the most vulnerable to climate change and, and sea level rise. And so you know we, we owe it to future generations to take responsibility for our actions today mm -hmm. uh, and invest in things like green energy you know that will help protect that infrastructure and develop our economy for the future. Mm, those are all great answers. So I have one person writing a question mm. about uh, the human trafficking. Right. So what have you done to, to fight uh, that human trafficking? That's the kind of crime, right? Yeah, uh, hum human trafficking, I, it's an awful, awful crime. Um, and it breaks my heart to know that that happens in Virginia. And most people are very surprised to find out that Virginia is, is a hot spot for human trafficking. They think that it happens elsewhere, not in our own backyard. Uh, but because we have uh, Dulles uh, Airport, you know, which is an international airport, we've got the Port of Panton Roads, and we've got I-95 and I-81, where you have a lot of truck traffic, international truck traffic, uh, Virginia has become a hot spot for human trafficking. Um, we have been working over the last 10 years to try to make the penalties tougher for human trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, this year, we passed um, our very first standalone bill mm -hmm. uh, aimed specifically at human trafficking that increases the penalties for those who engage in this awful, awful crime. Mm -hmm. um, the bills that I focused on were in response to our police who were saying, we know this is happening, but people aren't reporting it. And so. We can't use these new penalties if we don't know uh, where it's happening or who it's happening to. And so I worked with a group called the Polaris Project, mm -hmm. and they had a great idea, mm -hmm. which was to require certain establishments, businesses, to post the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Mm -hmm. And they did this in Texas, and so they looked at what kind of businesses is there likely to be uh, human trafficking conducted at. And then you require this to be posted so that somebody who might see something suspicious or you have a victim, they know where to call. Mm -hmm. And so we passed a law in Virginia. It was my bill to require this hotline be posted at uh, adult entertainment um, mm -hmm. venues as well as truck stops. Because mm -hmm. as much as you know, truckers are, are generally very good people, um, you know, this is where human trafficking happens. Mm -hmm. The great thing about it is that it's, it's really working. Um, mm -hmm. You look at the statistics and there's so many more people calling to report human trafficking in, in Virginia. And that's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. So that those people who are victims of human trafficking mm -hmm. can actually get the help that they need. And mm -hmm. so we've gone from being way behind on human trafficking in Virginia to really leading the pack. And I'm very, very proud of that. Mm -hmm. If some victims are like from other countries, what do you do with them? 
Sure. Well, and, and that's that's been part of what we've been working on is you know recognizing that these are really victims because oftentimes they're sex crimes. Mm -hmm. They're they're put into sexual servitude, and you don't want to treat them um, badly. Yeah, badly. Yeah. And so we we've got to train our our courts and our police to understand that these are victims mm -hmm. and that you need to provide them with the support and the help that they need and deserve because they've been through just an awful ordeal. Mm, great. So uh, uh, thank you so much having you. So uh, if you want to get more information, per, please check uh, David Bulova's uh, website. What is the website is? Sure, it's uh, www.davidbulova.com and you can also reach me on my Facebook page.